we can record and we're recording. And then Gail, can you share your screen? If you need yes, to? I will. I am going to share my screen. Um, before I do, this is a, a slideshow that I created for Apple, um, a section on collection management. Weeding is a very important part of collection management, but it is just one part. Um, in the Apple program, I also requested libraries to send me a copy of their collection management policy. Um, I listed the key components of the policy and then pointed them in the direction of uh, policies that have the key components. Um, library policies are the best insurance and safety net that a library can have and that includes what you're purchasing for your collection, um, the percentage you're purchasing, and by percentage I'm talking about of your collection budget, how much are you spending on DVDs, children, YA, um, adults, and the amount that you spend should be proportional to the amount of um, items that are checked out. So if you have really slow months in the winter because not a lot of adults are coming in and the bulk of your circulation is in the summer from because the summer library program and the bulk of your collection checking out is children's DVDs and juvenile materials and young adult materials, your budget needs to reflect that. Um, and that's, that, is, uh, that is there. I gave a couple of homework assignments in Apple. I'm not doing that here today, but if you're really keen on getting an A, you just send me an email and I will give you that homework. What it really does is it aligns to the public library standards revised in 2016, and it addresses the amount of your budget general fund that you're spending on your um, collection. Are you collecting ebooks? And um, I had them also go into the uh, state statistical survey and um, figure out some information there. That's an amazing tool. I know that we usually fill it out in January and are glad to be done with it for the next of the year, for rest of the year. But that is an amazing tool that you can use to really help you evaluate um, how things are going in your library and in your community. Okay, I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to try to talk slower um, and not race through this and that's always a challenge for me. But again, I'm Gail Santi. I'm the director of the Great Bend Public Library and the Central Kansas Library System. And this um, presentation is all about weeding. And if you're watching this in um, a recording, my email is gsanti. S-A-N-T-Y at C-K-L-S as in Sam dot org and um, the handouts are available on the website. Anybody in CKLS got an email with the handouts and um, you can find them there or you can email me and I will uh, get those to you. After this session is recorded, it will be posted to the Central Kansas Library System YouTube page, and that again will go out an email to our system libraries. I'm going to start sharing my screen now, and we will walk through this uh, PowerPoint. And here we go. And now you get to see my desktop in all its glory. And I will from the start. Here we go. So this is called to weed or not to weed. And I'm, I'm going to keep looking over here because I'm looking at your faces. And so it's kind of a, a goofy thing. Maybe if I come over here, that's a little better. I don't know. We'll get it together. Um, this PowerPoint heavily references the crew method and um, Don Volger at the State Library in Texas Oh, well, she, she's not at the State Library. She's in Texas, and she did a presentation on Attack Your Collection with Crew. And um, it was perfect. I did uh, tweak some things, but I really want to give her credit for that. Um, crew is a, a, an industry standard for weeding your library. So there is a collection cycle in libraries that is a about how we get our materials, what we do with them, and when we're done with them. And the components of the collection cycle are selection or acquisition. That's what you're going to buy. Then they're processed and ready for the shelves, and they're cataloged. 
if you're a CKLS library and you order through CKLS, um, your materials will come to you already processed and cataloged. Then they're ready for the shelf and they circulate. And when it's time for them to leave the shelves, it's called deselection or weeding. So every library collection management policy needs some key components. I know that this is a webinar on weeding, but you can um, run into some problems if you don't have these in place when it's time for weeding. Of course, you're going to need the library name. You need the reason for the policy, the purpose of your library collection. Um, if you don't have that stated in your library policy, then um, you can be collecting willy-nilly, or you can be called on it by a board member or someone in the in your community. If in your policy it says that the reason or the purpose of the collection is to provide educational and recreational materials to your community, that's broad enough that that covers it. You're going to need some basic selection guidelines. Um, we follow the American Library Association Freedom to Read, Freedom to View, and Library Bill of Rights. We purchase um, print and media for adults, um, juveniles, young adults, whatever is, is good for your community. While every policy should have these components, they will be individualized to your library and how your library serves your community. I also believe that a good policy needs to have the responsibility and authority. Um, I work a lot with librarians and trustees, and one of the common issues that we run into is that they don't know who's in charge of what. Um, it is the librarian's responsibility to run the library on a day-to-day -day basis. And so in this instance, it is the librarian's responsibility to weed the library. Board members need to be very aware of that. They need to know why the library needs to weeded, be weeded. And sharing this with them is, is one great way to do that. The authority for weeding does come from the library board. The library board sets policy that enables the librarian to run the library on a day-to-day -day basis. The librarian is responsible for deciding how that will get done, not the board. And so it is the librarian's responsibility to weed because she has been given that authority from her library board or his library board. And then also in a good collection management policy, there is plenty of information on weeding weeding and deselection and replacement of materials. Um, and I also just saw uh, the, the, I think it's the Salt Lake City or the Wichita Library, they both have very comprehensive policies, um, talked about the fee structure for replacing materials. Would that item be replaced at the initial purchase cost or would it be devalued or um, how that was gonna be dealt with? It's important to have this replacement component in the policy because um, if we purchase an audiobook through a library vendor, that book is going to be upwards of $75. That probably also comes with free replacements for the discs for a certain time period. A patron will not understand when we tell them that that replacement cost is $75 when they know they can go to Walmart or they can go to Amazon and buy it for 20 So having this information in your policy is key. It's also important to have information on weeding and deselection. A little bit of education about why we do it, um, what guidelines we follow when we do that, and you'll find tools for that here. Oh, hi, Kelly. Are you here? I hope so. We'll find tools for that in, in this PowerPoint as well. You also need in your policy on collection management information on gifts and donations, and that's money and materials. Um, when I worked at my, at my previous library, and we're always told not to say that, but this is, this is key here. I worked at an Air Force base for something that they lost 
that money did not come back to the library. That went into the Air Force Base General Fund, and I always tease that it would go and buy one bullet. Um, we did have some patrons who were buying um, boxes of bullets, though. So I always wanted them to give us a donation. I would tell them to go buy the book on Amazon in good used condition and come back. That may be one way that you handle replacement items. That's your choice. Um, but back to gifts and donations, what would also happen is that we would get donations in the library for books. We had lots of books. We just didn't have materials to process them. And so it's, it, in my opinion, it's best if you accept gifts of donations for money, especially with no ties on them, not to say that this will just be used on books, but that this will be used um, for purchasing and processing materials for circulation. That works. Talking about donations of materials, this is that, this is, this is that, um, that person that says, um, my mom has a bunch of books that she'd like to donate to the library. And when they start bringing them in, you found out that the mother died five years ago. The books have been stored in the basement and are covered in mold. Or maybe they were kept in the garage and um, some engine oil leaked over onto them. Or they're covered in spiders. Um, maybe the mom um, got every single uh, Reader's Digest edition of every book ever published. Um, these, things, these are things that you're not going to add to your collection. You should not add any donation of material items to your collection that you would not purchase right now if you had the money. Um, just because they're free to you as a gift does not mean they're free. Right now, the going standard on how much it costs to process an item, that means to put the covers on it, put the spine labels on it, and catalog it, is running about $15 a book per book. So even those things that come to you free have dollar signs attached to them. You should not be adding any donated item to your collection if it's not something that you would buy right now. One of the other things that I teach to my, especially my smaller libraries in the Central Kansas Library System is to check the shared library catalog for everything, first you've sorted through, everything that's bad is out of the place, and then you say, okay, I would, I would buy this and add it to the collection. Before you do that, you open up the catalog and you see how many other copies of that item are in the catalog. Um, if there are already 10 copies, and especially if you're a small library, you don't need to add that to the collection because, you, because of the shared consortium, your patrons already have access to 10 copies. So maybe there are three copies, and then you, the next step is to look and see when was the last time those were circulated, when they were added to the catalog and when they were circulated. If they were added five years ago and they've circulated once or twice, that's probably not a good item to add to the catalog, even though it meets the standards of, it's in good shape, it's something that I would buy right now if I had the money, and there aren't lots and lots of copies. You don't have to put yourself into a poverty mentality with adding things to your collection. That shelf space is very valuable, and anything you put on those shelves need to pay their way. I'm off my soapbox for a moment. I'll get right back on it again, I'm sure. Every collection development or management policy should also have a component that talks about your disposal of surplus materials and properties. What this does is it helps you say to your community and it helps your board members advocate and share that information out to your community about why we're taking things off the shelves and what we're going to do with them. Um, many libraries run a uh, kind of a book sale to get rid of their libraries. Before you do that, I really want you to consider your hourly wage versus the time that it takes to run the book sale and look at your profit and see if you really are making any money on that book sale. Book sales take an incredible amount of energy and work. There are other resources. Um, there, in fact, is a brand new resource that's a very exciting. It's um, a mission out of Wichita, and um, they work 
with um, men who have difficulty getting employment. They educate them there. They come to Kansas, anywhere in Kansas, and they'll pick up your materials for free, and then they'll take them back to um, their place of business. They're training these, these men to look on Amazon um, used book sales and to set these books up for sale and price them at a going rate and process them out and send them out when they're purchased. So anything that that is sellable, they send out and they sell, sell with it. The money that they get from that goes right back in 100% into the mission to do more training for these gentlemen. If they have books that don't sell, they have contracted with a recycler and they get turned into cardboards. So this is amazing. I was so excited when I found this out. Um, if you want more information on that, I know that Margie Shepard is going to send some of that stuff out later this month. It is very exciting. Um, some of the sources that we've used in the past, like Better World Books, are just not really... Um, agreeable to doing a lot of business with with uh, huge amounts of withdrawn library materials anymore. So so check and, and if you have any questions you can always ask any of the CKLS consultants because we've got a lot of ideas on how to do this, how to dispose of those weeded items, but also how to talk to your community about what you're doing with them and why you did it. Perhaps one of the most important components of your policy is reconsideration. That is also how you will step by step deal with items that are challenged. And we're talking about um, uh, anything. Any, anyone can come in and say, I don't like this book. I don't think it's appropriate. And I want you to remove it from the library shelves absolutely make sure that you've got a reconsideration policy, in a, a component in your collection management policy. If you do not, please contact us right away and we will help you craft that, um, give you several options so that your library board has the tools they need to implement this policy. Additionally, every collection management policy should include the Library Bill of Rights, the freedom to read, and the freedom to view statements, as well as the date of the review. Okay, let's go on. Some of you know, may know this 80-20 or Pareto principle. The first time I saw it, it was talking about the clothes and shoes in your closet. And how that works is that you only wear 20% of your items in your closet 80% of the time, and the rest of the things don't get used. This Pareto principle was not just designed for the clothes in your closet or for the books on your shelves. It's for all kinds of things, but it is very true. If you run the statistics, run the reports in Pathfinder Central or in your library catalog, you will discover that 20% of your books are responsible for 80% of your circulation. The reason that I bring that up here is because that blows the, um, the notion that I need to keep that, it's, it's, it's checking out once in a while, or um, I need to keep it just in case. We're not building library collections for just in case, we're building library collections that are viable, that are being used, that are relevant to what our community wants and needs now, not what we wanted and needed 30 years ago. Um, can you see this? There you go. This is an example of something that should definitely be weeded. You can see, can you all see it? It's um, the gold medal Olympics decathlon winner, Bruce Jenner. I'm looking for that. See, the pages are so sticky. 1977. Okay, I wasn't even out of high school yet. This is how old this is. This was on a library shelf. I think that there is more current information about Bruce Jenner than um, this book from 1977. Just an example. Okay, so what is the crew method? The crew method is short for continuous review, evaluation, and weeding. So what are some of the benefits of weeding? Well, of course, you're gonna save space. 
there is a five finger rule in um, libraries that is you're not going to find it in any textbook that I've found it so far but it, it is common sense and and what we like to call an industry standard um, your shelves should never be more than 85% full 75% is even better so that means on me this finger to this finger is about seven to nine inches that's how much space needs to be empty on every single one of your shelves I did not make up these numbers, the 8575. This is straight from the crew manual, which is the industry standard for weeding. Weeding also saves time in a couple of different places. It saves the time of the patron. A lot of patrons, when they see that the shelves are full and they try to pull something out and it looks like the whole thing is going to avalanche on them, they'll just leave it be and they'll walk away without the information that they want or they need. If you are shelving books, and see Kellis librarians, I'm especially talking to you, you know this. If you are shelving books, um, it is very frustrating to have to squeeze the shelves out and move things around just so you can put one thin children's book or one thin um, paperback on the shelf. Those are two ways that it saves time, but right here, of course, people are busy, so you don't waste their time. Um, you don't uh, keep false information on the shelves. Give them what they want now, not what they wanted when your grandmother ran the library. I'm a grandmother, so I can say that. My grandmother never ran a library, though. There are many benefits of weeding. Here are some more. Appeal. People are attracted to new and good looking materials. Um, one thing that we hear every single time that the Seekillis weeding team goes out to a library, we hear it back every single time. Patrons will come in. Some patrons will complain about everything's off the shelves, but most of the patrons will say, wow, when did you get all these new books? These aren't new books. These are the books that were on your shelves. Your patrons could not see the gems because they were stuck in amongst all the old non-relevant materials anymore. When you weed, you enhance your library's reputation in your community as a trusted source for information. On your shelves, you should have material that is reliable. That means that you don't have books like this. Does AIDS hurt? It's the second edition from 1992. Do you really want your doctor to learn about AIDS from a book like this? Is this what you want the children in your community, because this is a children's book? No, it's not. It's an adult book. Yeah, we, we need to take these things out. You need. Medical information should be no older than five years old. Not five years from when you added it to your collection, but five years from when it was published. That's the copyright date we're talking about here. Legal information is the same. Computer information especially. You don't need to keep books on um, Microsoft Vista or MS-DOS. Um, just don't need to keep those anymore. Um, word processing for seniors that was ages and ages ago. Those aren't current. Your patrons are not going to pull those things off the shelves because they're bad sources of information. So I briefly mentioned the poverty mentality. Excuse me. These are some of the excuses that we have um, as to why librarians don't weed their collections. They're afraid that if they weed the library, they will have nothing. To me, this excuse may be the worst because they know that the library collection needs to be weeded and they know that what's on there is in bad shape, but they think that bad is good enough. And that's just not the case, especially if you're on Pathfinder Central, we have over 700,000 unique records. That's not unique items. That's unique records. If you can't find 
the item in Pathfinder Central for your patrons, you've got share it. You've got interlibrary loan through the state of Kansas. If you can't find it, you can contact ILL at CKLS.org and our great ILL department will look beyond the walls of Kansas for that for you. Far better for you to have empty shelves that are full of great information great and current recreational re reading materials than shelves full of things that are not going to get used. I don't have enough money to buy new materials. Again, we know that your collection budgets are slim. CKLS has a materials grant as part of our competitive grant cycle. It cycles every three years. The last time that we had that competitive grant, we had a lot of money left over because libraries did not apply for that grant. Um, we also know that you get money from CKLS regularly. Yes, that can go to pay um, the librarian, it can go to uh, programming and things like that, but consider materials as well. Um, the last one is a little bit sticky. Um, so and so, um, a very important person from the town donated this and their feelings are going to be hurt if I don't add it to the collection or they've passed on and their family will be angry if I pull it out of the collection. This last statement is the reason that you have a specific component in your collection management policy that addresses donations. It's very important. What some libraries do is they um, they have a policy that they can weed donations, but they pull out the page that might say donated by so-and-so. Um, what some libraries will also do is they will try to contact the donor's family and see if they want it back. That's a lot of work. If your collection policy addresses donations and gifts in a way that's appropriate for your library, you may not have to do all of that work. I'm going to get a drink. I'm dry in the morning. Okay. How do we figure out what to weed? Weeding is a very emotional subject. Um, most of us uh, entered the profession because we enjoy reading, and some of us love books. But that's a strength in our profession, but that's also a weakness when it comes time to weeding. So the crew method has laid out some very subjective and not um, objective criteria to help you learn what to read, and that is musty. Is it misleading? Like both of these. Very misleading. Is it ugly? This one, it's in bad shape. Look at this. It's in bad shape. Is it superseded? I would say that even though this AIDS book is the second edition, there probably is something newer. Is it trivial or no longer of interest? Here's a doozy. Can you read this one there? I need to point it to you. So this is um, Be Your Own Boss and Retire at Home with profitable, profitable Earthworm Farming. It could only have been better if it said Get Rich Quick with Earthworm Farming. But you can start on just a few dollars or nothing. Um, that's probably not irrelevant. I wonder when that was published. Let me look real quick. 1975, um, we don't have a lot of people trying to retire on their earthworm farm anymore, and available elsewhere, um, and that's what your library, shared library catalog is about. So you can always remember Musty. So there's more criteria. Musty was subjective. This is objective. So you go XX Musty. So let's do it on this one here. And this is my most favorite book ever that I have um, removed from a library. It is Arlene Dahl, who was just granted an absolute beauty. Um, I believe that she was Lorenzo Lamas's mother. I'm not the, the guru on the Hollywood stars, but gorgeous woman. And it is um, Always Ask a Man by Arlene Dahl, The Key to Femininity. Okay, so when was it published? The copyright date, 1965. Um, and how long can it be sitting on your shelves without checking out? This was 20 years. It had not checked out. So uh, this, is, this is definitely a candidate for weed, weeding poor Arlene. 
let's look at this one here. We've got the complete book of mopeds. I always wanted a moped, but of course I didn't have one. Now the tricky part is, let's see, this was published in 1977. Um, so it's definitely old. When we're weeding shelves, when the sea killer team goes out, we always ask, how far back do you want us to go? Sometimes we start at 10 years. And so we'll weed a couple of shelves, weed things out that are older than 10 years. And then we assess it. And sometimes that wasn't enough. Sometimes if you've got a really robust collection budget, you have more things coming in. And so we'll need to go back five years. I have recently in a lot of places seen five years is the standard now. That's it. A lot of libraries, it's five years. Maximum permissible, permissible time without use is three years. And so books like the complete book of mopeds from the 70s that again hasn't checked out since the first five years that it was added to the collection, out of there. If I were Julie a child, I'd be throwing eggshells over my shoulders. <laughs> when I was a child, I thought she had a magic kitchen that cleaned up after herself. Okay. Now, nonfiction is a whole different animal. Nonfiction, that's our more enduring works. Um, unlike the nonfiction items that I shared with you there. But we don't have to guess. Musty and crew have done that work for us, for all of the things that aren't really adult fiction. So if you've got books in the 400s in your nonfiction section, the crew method in Musty says you shouldn't have anything in your 400 section with a copyright date older than 10 years and it should have checked out within the last three years, and then it follows the musty information again. So then we come back to, and I'm not going to go back. I'm going to just have it right here. One more page. Doop -doo. Misleading. Um, I might have gone blank. Well, that's just okay. I'll just move on. You'll notice that, and I'm pointing to my screen like, like you can see me pointing to it. Um, the, the numbers for copyright dates vary a great deal. You'll notice that in YA fiction, young adult fiction, which is um, on the right, the copyright date should be no older than three years old and it shouldn't have checked out more than two years, have, should have gone by without checking it out. For juvenile and nonfiction, it says to use the adult formulas. This also counts for your um, news, newspapers, periodicals, biographies, graphic novels, just all kinds of things. Where there is an X for the musty, as in graphic novels, um, fiction, and children's books, that's where the librarian needs to set the standard for copyright date. This chart is very, very handy. What this information does collectively is it helps take out the emotion from weeding. I don't think that as a librarian, I do think that one of the most difficult things we have to do is we have to weed a book that we thought would be wonderful that has never checked out. That's very difficult. So we've talked about print, but let's talk about media. If you'll notice on my screen, on the right-hand side, you've got non-print materials, film formats, and those both reference worst. What time is it? Oh, I'm doing great. So instead of musty, for media, we use worst. Is it worn out? Um, are you still using um, VHS tapes that the tape is a little crinkly and it always gets caught up in one spot? Is it out of date? Is it rarely used? Is it supplied elsewhere? And was it trivial or faddish? And I'm going to have to start collecting some um, examples of those because I don't have any, but most of us know which kind of titles we're talking about. Um, by and large, most of the libraries in our system have removed their um, VHS tapes. And before that happened, we would ask, um, how often do your items checked out? And we would be told they check out a lot. But when we would run the statistics, um, the numbers proved otherwise. Um, again, 20, 
80% of the collection was not checking out. There might have been 20% of the VHS that were checking out, but we were holding on to everything just in case. Um, we don't need to do that. Um, audiobooks on cassette are generally out now. Um, the audiobook industry format is pretty much driven by the automobile. The audiobook format is driven by the automobile industry and they're not making cars now that have cassette players in them. Oh, sorry. I have to go back one, two, three and start there. Okay, so if you've got materials that just aren't used, again, that's one of the hardest things we've got to do. When do you weed them? If they haven't circulated for three to five years, they need to go. If you have duplicate copies, if you had something that was really popular and you knew it was going to get a lot of use, so you purchased multiple copies, if that item is no longer popular, you do not need to keep duplicate copies. This is tough. If you have sets or series of books, you don't have to keep the unused volumes. Hot topics popular more than five years ago. I think this one, this one will qualify. Definitely more than five years. In nonfiction, especially if you have more books than you need on any one topic. So if you've got a whole bunch of books on the fall of the Berlin Wall, um, that's an old topic and you probably just need to pick the best one or two. And again, formats that are no longer popular. If it's poor content, when do we weed it? If it's outdated and obsolete, computers, law, science, space, is Pluto a planet in your library? Will man get to the moon or when man lands on the moon? Are those in your library? We have found those within the last 10 years in some of our libraries. If it has to do with health, five years, technology, five years, travel, those are hard to pull. Um, but the truth is, is that places in communities where you might travel to um, institutions like restaurants and things like that, they're going to close. Um, the hours might change. The days that they're open might change. The cost for entrance might change. Outdated popular culture. I don't really think that earthworm farming ever fell into popular culture, though. Inaccurate or false information, and this is the AIDS book again. Repetitious series, unneeded duplicates, self-published <clears throat> self or small press titles that are not circulating, especially those that were added as gifts or donations. You, even if you have a very small collection budget, you still can be picky about what goes onto your shelves. And you should especially be fussy about what comes off of your shelves. When do I weed by appearance? If your items are worn out or ragged, if it's poorly bound or falling apart, if you open up the book and say, wait, let me tape this together before I check it out to you, that item needs to be withdrawn. Sure, give it to your patron, but when it comes back, don't put it back on the shelves. Withdraw it from your collection. Items that have been rebound that are really worn out need to go. Books were never intended to last forever. Items that are dirty, marked up, smell of smoke, warped, moldy, yellowing, faded. We could go on and on. Um, small print or poor quality pictures, scratched, CDs and DVDs, don't keep sending those out. Send them to CKLS once, and if they're able to be repaired, good. If not, then you need to withdraw them. Children's books are hard for us to withdraw because I loved that book. That Oh, that book was my best friend. That I read that book in my treehouse one summer. We have such emotions attached to children's books, but there are guidelines. You want to think boutique, and you want to think high quality and a current selection. You want the best of the best in your library. Um, 
you want to be careful about um, interests that are way out there. You don't really always want to buy the books that are your favorite author. You want a broad representation. I love, love, love those soft colored pencil and watercolor illustrations. And when my granddaughter, who is six now, and my grandson is two, when I go to read, or they come to my house to read, we'll read one or two of those, and then they'll put their hand on me and they'll say, Grammy, don't you have anything else to read? That's not what they're interested in. They want things that are edgier and brighter. Um, that was hard for me, but I'm there. I'm adding those. Board books get chewed and dragged and tossed and played with, and they get worn out. They should be replaced more often if, if you collect board books. And this is important. Those perennial favorites like the little house books, um, oh, uh, choose your own adventure are popular again. Um, those books do get worn out and they do need to repl be replaced. Nancy Drew books are, are, are a good example that the children today don't want to check out the Nancy Drew books with the covers from the 50s and 60s. You can put the same book, exact same book, right next to it, but from a 50s edition with the cover and a modern edition with the cover, and they're going to pull the modern one and they're not going to pull the old one. Young adult books, my goodness, this one's actually kind of easy. You are ruthless in this section. You should really not have anything older than five years old in your whole collection if it's not circulating well. Back to Nancy Drew, outdated cover art. Um, I put paperbacks here because often librarians are loath to collect paperbacks because they just don't last as long. YA, young adult, is the perfect section for paperbacks. Those materials in particular are not in, they're not meant to last forever, and this collection needs to be weeded hard and often. So you need to remember this. These are the most important things here. These are your takeaway items. Having anything on your shelf is not better than nothing. Um, far better for you to have an empty section than a bunch of outdated, irrelevant, poor quality items. Know your online resources. You've got access to a number of ebooks and downloadable digital books through the State Library, and you've also got access to Sunflower eLibrary. Um, turn your patrons on to these as well. You shouldn't keep your 1980s copy of the World Book Encyclopedia with the beautiful butterfly when they're all in the right order because the information's out of date and you've got access to something that's even better online. What that can do for you, oh my gosh, it's so exciting. You can click, so if you look up lions, they've got sound bites in there that the lions roar and they've got videos embedded. You don't get that out of an out of date book. Remember that it is far better to lack books than to provide bad or unsafe information. I'll come back to this doozy. This should be off your shelf. Better for you to have nothing on your library shelves about AIDS than something that is bad information. If you don't want your doctor using this information to treat you, it should not be on your shelves. And beyond that, five years. So for nonfiction, use the crew guidelines by Dewey Class. And that will help guide you in what you are doing with nonfiction. Nonfiction is hard to weed because it's often more expensive initially. And I'm looking for, I keep losing things. I can't find anything. Anyway, nonfiction is more expensive. Those books are very expensive, and that makes it hard for us to weed them when we don't see them. Um, moving on our shelves. And I said I keep losing things. If you look back here, you can see a pile of stuff. Um, my desk right now is kind of cobbled together, and um, the boxes back here are my sh shelves and file cabinets. Hopefully the next time you see me, I'll be better situated. Um, I did finish early because I didn't go over homework. I'm going to go ahead and escape, and I'm going to close that down, and 
I'm, hmm, how do I make it not share? I think I need to go to maybe participants. Nope, I'm not sure. That's something we need to figure out is how to not share. It's all up here. I'm just, yeah, I don't want him to see my desktop anymore. That's okay. Yeah. Hmm. We'll learn. Doesn't matter. Okay. Stop sharing. Yay. Andy found it. Great. Okay. Yay. He's the best. Um, and Mary Beth just popped in again to make sure we were doing great. Um, that's all I have. If you have any questions, um, I'd be glad to field them. Or if you have any comments as well, we can, we can do that as well. Anything? Okay. Oh, yes. I have a question for you, Gail. Yes, ma'am. Is it important to make sure that you communicate with your board and get on the same page when you are considering a weeding? Yes, unequivocally, yes. Um, ideally, your collection policy addresses weeding. Your board is aware of that policy and supports that policy. Um, Board members as a whole operate as a corporate body, and while one individual may not want to weed, it is their responsibility to support the decision of the full board, and in this instance, to support the librarian doing their daily work. Um, one of the things that we uh, at CKLS do is we have a weeding contract before the CKLS team comes out and that has to be shared with the library board. We also have information available on how to share that information with your community. Um, we have uh, this last year um, probably set the record. We had a couple of libraries that had not been weeded since probably the 70s. Um, and the librarians requested a very thorough weeding and um, we weeded a lot of books. And so if they had not educated the board on that ahead of time, and if the board and the librarian had not already started talking about what was going to happen in the community, a lot of people would have been upset. Crystal, do you know how many books we weeded out of um, Phillipsburg? I'll bet Ederlet remembers too. It was a lot. I believe it was around 5,000. Almost 9,000. <laughs> Wow. Um, that library looks amazing now. Um, we heavily weeded in Lebanon as well. That looks amazing. They weeded and they were able to rearrange their library. It doesn't look cramped and cluttered. It's a small space, but it looks phenomenal. Any other questions? All right. I'm going to go ahead in just a little bit and we're going to stop the recording. We've had frigid Arctic weather came, come through central Kansas today. When I went out this morning, I thought, oh, this is almost as cold as Alaska. Um, and uh, wisely, our school districts closed schools. And often when the school district is closed, libraries are closed. And so we have a lot of librarians um, who are not at work today. This, are, this will be archived and we will send out the archive with a link to the, um, the slideshow and the handouts as well. I want to thank you for being here. And um, this is our inaugural uh, Tuesdays with CKLS. And I think that it will get better as we go along. And thank you. Have a great day. Bye, everybody.